if I can introduce Mats, Mats is the head of International Trade Unit with EY. He has been here in the IEA before in 2014, and we were reflecting on how different times are from 2014, such a short time ago. Um, Matt is, as I said, uh, the current head of international trade at EY, uh, following his previous role as a special advisor to Prime Minister Cameron, uh, and he was appointed to that position in 2015. In this role, he advocated David Cameron's EU reform program and the UK's EU membership prior to the uh, referendum in June of last year. He was previously director of Open Europe, a, another think tank which promotes ideas for political and economic reform in Europe, and he was instrumental in changing the organization's focus from being a UK think tank opposing UK involvement in further EU integration to become a European think tank advocating liberal EU-wide reforms. I hope that's a fair description. Um, to do so, this off, did I no. <laughs> you can uh, interrogate all of these comments in a moment. Uh, he recruited a pan-EU staff. He also co-founded Open Europe Berlin. So, um, he, uh, Matt is going to address us on uh, the future EU-UK trade relations. So, without any further ado, I hand over to you, Matt. Please, please interject, heckle, throw things at me, whatever you want to do. Um, right, so, so whenever I do, um, uh, you know, whenever I do these Brexit talks, and I do quite a few of them, um, I tend to start off by uh, telling the story from the night of the referendum, uh, the UK's referendum on, on the EU. Uh, so June the 23rd last year, going into the early hours of June the 24th. And I was in Downer Street um, that evening, um, and I was watching the result coming in together with the Prime Minister at the time, David Cameron, uh, George Osborne, the Chancellor at the time, as well as various others, uh, other advisors. Um, and I mean, there's a lot one can say about that, but, but the surprise, and I would perhaps say shock, um, when one of the first results came in from Sunderland in Northern England. Um, Sunderland, of course, is home to the Nissan factory. Um, employing, I think, around 7,000 people in Sunderland, one of the biggest private employers in that region. Um, six, out of uh, six out of ten cars produced in Sunderland, I think, are exported, man many of them to the EU, uh, free of tariffs, free of barriers, free of additional trade costs because of EU membership. Nissan had come out quite strongly in favour of a Remain vote prior to the referendum. Um, if you want an illustration for the importance to the UK, to UK local jobs and growth um, uh, of EU membership, then Sunderland was your key illustration. Um, the result came in there when we sat in number 10. Uh, the BBC was reporting it shortly after midnight. Does anyone know what the result in Sunderland was? You, you get an extra gold star on the EU flag if you do. So what was the result in Sunderland? Does anyone know? I was presenting to Disney uh, the other day, by the way, um, or a few weeks ago now, Disney, you know, the cartoon, and so I was surrounded by fluffed animals and various things, and they got this right, so um, are you smarter than the fluffed animals? That's the question. <laughs> or animated, or yeah. Anyone, where's your guess? You usually have sort of a bit more... 61, good. 61% in, in favor of leave, of course. So you can hear a penny drop in number 10 down the street when that result came in. And the reason one was telling that story is because I think that's what Brexit is, right? It's something much more fundamental than the precise trading relationship between the UK and the EU. It's about social and political forces um, that are very prevalent in the UK but exist elsewhere as, as well. So always keep that in mind when you think about Brexit. It's not only a narrow trade issue, it's about something much, much bigger. And that is the challenge involved. And Brexit is a big expression of that kind of forces that we're seeing across Western democracies. But it's not only the expression. Right. <clears throat> I, I, of course, I only told that story to cred credentialize myself and show that I was in number 10. But <laughs> moving along. Um, so, so I brought some pictures because I'm now at EY. Um, and if you're at EY or any of the big four, as uh, my colleague from KPMG will know, you cannot do anything without some sort of PowerPoint presentation. Uh, it's impossible. I literally cannot move. I have to show up to dinners with a PowerPoint presentation in order to socialize. Uh, so therefore, I brought some pictures. Um, so 
This is just to recap on where we're at in the negotiations and what the timeline looks like. You know, I always like to conceptualize Brexit in three or four different phases. Um, so as you know, Article 50, the only legal way for a country to leave the European Union, um, was triggered on in March this year. And Article 50 gives uh, the UK and the EU exactly two years to negotiate the UK's exit from the EU and hopefully also a new trading arrangement. So two years from March uh, 2017. Um, now, um, the four phases I think involved here is, you, so you have the negotiation phase, uh, which in turn is split into uh, the negotiation over the withdrawal agreement and then the negotiations over the future trading relationship. So that's sort of two phases. And then you move into post-March 2019, a transition phase, a very likely transition period in my view, um, that can last anywhere between two to five years, depending a bit on what the two parties want in the end. And then post-2022, 2023, 2024, you have the new permanent arrangement between the two, the two uh, parties. So those are the Brexit phases, and they matter tremendously. Um, uh, for the conversations I have with businesses across sectors, um, because this is what business plan around, right? So, but these are the four phases. So where are we at the moment? Well, we're very much in the first phase, um, the uh, discussions around the withdrawal agreement. So what the EU side has said is that um, in order to move on to the, the discussions around a future relationship, we need to make significant progress on the withdrawal agreement. Um, no one knows exactly what the significant progress means, <coughs> but um, the withdrawal agreement includes uh, a divorce bill, so how much the UK will pay up um, as a result of leaving the EU. It includes the discussion around uh, what will happen to UK citizens in the EU and EU citizens in the UK, as well as some broader discussions, which was, for example include the North-South border. Um, the withdrawal agreement is incredibly important to watch what happens with that because it basically now um, will decide anything else that will follow, right? So if we can't make significant progress on that, then we're in trouble. So, but those are the four phases. Um, you will be familiar with this, so I don't need to dwell on them. So in terms of dynamics involved in, in Brexit, and particularly on the UK side, um, I think it's, it's, it's useful to conceptualize this, and I'm sorry if this becomes a bit UK-centric, but I think it's, it's, it's useful to conceptualize this in terms of a, uh, a five-way negotiations. If you're Theresa May, you're effectively involved in a five-way negotiation at the moment. And it's, it's in very important, if you want to understand where Brexit is going, to understand all five of these different players and the interaction between them. So I think that will very much decide what kind of arrangement we will end up in the end. Uh, with in the end. So a five-way negotiation. So, so if you're Theresa May at the moment, you, you have to deal with your own cabinet, you have to deal with the UK Parliament, you have to deal with the business community and the wider economic picture, you have to deal with devolved administrations, and then of course the EU itself, which is a hugely multifaceted and diverse player in its own right. So those are the five players involved. So let me just discuss a bit each of them in turn and where the latest is at um, with, uh, with the Brexit negotiations. So as you know, we've had a, an election in the UK in June, um, which resulted in a hung parliament in Theresa May losing a majority. We've also had a number of developments over the summer, which are really interesting to look at in terms of the future relationship. So what are these developments? Well, let's take the cabinet first. So cabinet, in, the cabinet, in the UK cabinet, you at the moment have a bit of a standoff between what you can call the sort of liberal wing and not quite the nationalist wing, because that's putting it a bit un unkindly, but, but sort of the, the kind of the, the liberal wing and the more kind of sort of UK-centric wing, if you will. Um, and that's a big standoff um, around I issues like immigration in particular. What has happened since the election is that within the UK cabinet, the liberal wing, the likes of Philip Hammond, and this is no secret, um, has massively increased its influence. Um, so... In the cabinet, in the internal cabinet discussions, um, there is now increased influence amongst those who want a liberal outward looking uh, United Kingdom. But anyway, Theresa May is involved in a very tricky balancing act in keeping her own cabinet together. That's, that's sort of one. Two is the UK Parliament. Um, Theresa May does not have a majority on her own, which means that she has to rely on uh, DUP 
for a supply agreement. So the UP is not part of the government, but they have uh, pledged to support the UK government in Parliament. Um, but she's also very vulnerable because even with the UP, the minority is very small. So, so Parliament, the parliamentary dynamics is incredibly important because you are now going to have a number of Brexit bills going through Parliament over the autumn and going into the new year, which will be needed to facilitate Brexit. Um, if you start to lose on those, then that becomes a difficult issue for her. What has happened in the last few weeks, which is really interesting, is that the opposition party, the main opposition party, Labour, has sort of switched its position uh, into contemplating the UK remaining a member of the single market and the customs union. That is not yet game-changing, but it has the potential to be. Um, so if you're Theresa May at the moment, your biggest fear is that your, your Remain Tory MPs, your pro-Remain Tory MPs, start to side with Labour MPs and you lose your majority. If you Europe, you may look like that as an opportunity if you think that Britain should stay in the single market because that's the, that's the route to the single market for the UK. But as sort of parliamentary numbers going into this autumn will be absolutely crucial. So that's the second big element. The third one then is business, the business community. Um, and um, uh, this, again, particularly since the election in June, has become a significantly more important voice. Um, there's a lot one can say about this. I mean, I do, I, you know, speak to a lot of businesses across sectors. And um, I think we sort of, it's starting to hit home now that um, if you're UK-based UK -based business, but also if you're an Irish-based business, um, you're going to be impacted by Brexit. Some, there are some businesses that see opportunities. Um, I mean, there's certainly some Irish businesses who see opportunities. And for Ireland, there are, of course, some opportunities if businesses choose to relocate from the UK. But as I always say, for every one opportunity involved in Brexit, I think the business community sees, t sees 10 challenges. I mean, that's the relationship, the ratio between opportunity and challenge. So, but the business community in the UK, I think, has become significantly more important over the last few months. And what's really interesting to watch is if UK firms start to signal that they will start to really uh, push the button on relocating elsewhere. Because that becomes a quite big problem for the government. And I think, I would argue that uh, the business community in the UK, but perhaps also here in Ireland, are entering a quite important five to six month window when they will have to make business decisions around you know, operating models, around where to be, where to base their... You know, um, redistribution centre, for example, if the UK ends up, uh, ends up outside the customs union, because of the lead times involved, um, they will have to make a decision fairly soon. So, and, and to see how the UK government will respond to that will be very important, but I think it does matter that the business community has become more important. I will say that increases the likelihood of a softer Brexit. Um, four area, fourth area, the fourth big player <coughs> is the devolved administrations in the UK. Uh, loads one can say about that, but of course the situation in Northern Ireland is very important here, and interaction between that and Brexit will be very important to watch. And finally, the EU itself. Um, and, um, uh, you know, there's a lot one can say about the EU negotiation position. Um, but, um, you know, what I will say is having actually been part of a team that has negotiated in Europe is that once the EU has agreed a common set of principles and processes, principles and processes, it's very difficult to go back and change those. EU negotiations, as many of you will know, operate by principle and process. And the EU has agreed a common set of principle and processes that they publish in the spring. Um, which, in my view, set the parameters for negotiations. Now, there's plenty of flexibility and ambiguity in those principles and processes, but there are some things that, in my view, still is not possible. So I, I, my view, for example, is that it's still not possible, or I should be careful what I say, but I have not seen any evidence of the EU being willing to accept a single market-style arrangement for the UK, but without full free, free movement of people. Um, you know, what I'm talking about there is the idea of Britain now negotiating an emergency break on numbers, um, which we sort of talked about many times before, but has never really happened. You know, it would be interesting to hear views in the room on this point, but if you, certainly if you're Labour, the Labour Party in the UK, 
uh, this is one of the things that you perhaps will in the end try to gun for, stay in the single market, but with some sort of control mechanism on migration numbers from the UK, because it's very difficult for the Labour Party to sell full free movement of people. Uh, even for the Labour Party, that's going to be difficult. Remember, seven out of ten Labour constituents have voted for Leave, and in large part because of free movement. So, so, but to me, the EU position does not accommodate for a single market without free movement. The old thing that I've heard so many times, and that you guys, many of you, repeat as well, that the four freedoms come together or go together still hold true. So, obviously, a very important discussion. Very keen to hear thoughts in the room on that. So, but those, that is basically the five way negotiations that Theresa May is facing. And the interaction between the five here uh, will be incredibly interesting to watch. Anyone who tells you that they know exactly how this is going to play out in the next several months is either lying and trying to sell you something. Um, and, uh, you know, because this is incredibly unpredictable. Having said that, um, I will move to trying to predict where we end up. Um, so these are my scientifically proven probabilities. Because obviously I predicted Brexit, I predicted Trump, and I predicted that Theresa May would lose a majority. Um, like all of you did as well. Um, but these are my probabilities around roughly where we will end up <coughs> in terms of a new trading relationship. You will be familiar with these different post-Brexit models. When people talk about post-Brexit arrangements, they usually mention sort of four to six. Um, so the European Economic Area uh, or Single Market Membership, the two are used interchangeably often. Um, that's, the sort of, that's the softest of soft Brexits. The next in line, the next one on the scale is uh, membership of a some, some sort of customs union, which means that you have no customs border uh, between the UK and the EU, but also means that the UK will not fully run its own trade policy. Then next in line is a more traditional free trade agreement, um, you know, a, a sort of a more comprehensive version of the trade agreement that exists between, for example, the EU and South Korea, or the one that you know, is soon coming into force between the EU and Canada. And then finally, um, you know, this hardest Brexit will be a very limited deal or no deal at all, uh, which would mean that the UK and EU will trade in large part based on World Trade Organization rules. So, I mean, these are the post-Brexit models that people usually have in mind. Um, so if you go down the line here and look at the probabilities on all of those, um, controversially, I still think it's very difficult to see how the UK remains an EU member. Um, in order for that to happen, a number of things will have to happen, which I've the path to the UK remaining a member is set out here. I do have a thing that can change quite quickly, though, because it's such a fluid environment, and we can discuss how, how that might change. But I think at the moment, the thing to remember about whether Brexit can be stopped or not, which a lot of people are getting excited about, is that a number <coughs> of political things and events have to materialise for that to happen um, that aren't imminent. But it's not completely impossible. Equally, uh, for reasons I mentioned earlier around free movement, I still think it's a rather low probability of Britain remaining a member of the single market because of free movement. That's the main issue there. Um, there's higher probability, in my view, of a customs union arrangement because that's something that Labour is potentially pushing for. It's something that Conservative MPs are contemplating. It's also something they can probably do without free movement of people, maybe, depending on what the EU says. But Traditionally, customs union arrangements have not come with free movement of people. Sorry, just um, I, I'm sorry to interrupt. It's fine. It's fine. Point of clarity: a customs union will not remove customs borders. Um, a customs union, the only situation where you just your customs identify yourself for the rest sorry. of the room, if you don't mind. Thank you. Tony Buckley, I'm um, with The only arrangement that will guarantee no customs procedures is full membership of the EU uh, because the internal market is based on the entirety of the treaties. The customs union as such, the customs union is specified as removing tariffs. So it will remove tariffs. It won't remove a customs border. Sorry for interrupting. No, no, no. It's, a, it's, a, it's a very important point. So, 
So, and of course you're absolutely right. So if you look at Turkey, so Turkey has the C88 form. You still have to fill out. They still have to have some rules of origin. So you're absolutely right. So if you, if you follow the uh, Turkish model, uh, then you will definitely have a border. I think what the UK government has in mind, uh, if, they, if they go for a customs arrangement, is something much, much better than Turkey. Um, uh, so because, because why, would you, why would you want to have the Turkey model? You would have the border, but without the ability to sign the free trade agreement. So I think that's a really good clarification. Thank you. But so so there's a twenty. So but I still it's some sort of customs union arrangement. Um, uh, certainly is, is is a higher probability there than uh, than perhaps around single market for the reasons that we discussed. The central probability to me though uh, the most central scenario to me remains the free trade agreement um, because uh, particularly because you know if you if you put together the UK's traditional red lines as well uh, uh, together with the, the EU's principles and processes that they have agreed. Uh, that's where you basically land uh, on current evidence. So the UK says it wants to end free movement, it wants to end large-scale financial contributions, it wants to end ECJ, direct ECJ jurisdiction, and it wants to run its own trade policy. You cannot do that unless there's an FTA. So, so I, think, I think still that's, that's where we are. Um, that can still be a very comprehensive free trade agreement, uh, and, and we can discuss what that might look like. Um, but it can, you know, there's no reason why it shouldn't be more comprehensive than, uh, than, for example, what the EU and Canada have. I think you can have a substantially more comprehensive free trade agreement than what that agreement is. Um, but then, of course, on a less, you know, upbeat note, um, I genuinely think there's still uh, a real risk of uh, there being no deal or only a withdrawal agreement. Um, that's something that is under discussed that you may leave only with a withdrawal agreement, which means that f for a period of time you may end up with WTO. Um, I think it's inconceivable that WTO rules will be the permanent arrangement because of the huge implications that would involve. Um, but um, you know there is a risk, and the main risk involved here is if, the main risk here is that uh, the clock simply runs out because we have so little time left to agree everything that we need to agree. The main thing for me, when, whenever we talk about Brexit, is to try to now avoid confirmation bias, right? I mean, you see so much confirmation bias on all sides. Brexit is very likely to happen, and we need to find a constructive way through. And, and so that's my plea in closing, that um, it's easy to, to be very negative about it. Um, but I think good ideas are definitely needed. So please, let's come up with some good ideas. Actually, literally now, let's solve Brexit. <laughs>